for people who knew there was a danger not to flee. However, this does create a difficulty for demographers. And one has to note that these individuals did not think about our problems. Because when you have some exceptional event, like a natural disaster or a war, in which some people die and some people flee, after there is quiet, what do you see? You see empty houses. What do you not know? What was the fate of the people in the houses? Who ran away, or who, died, who, or who was killed, or who died of hunger or of disease? They may not be alive, but it was not because of violence. What we do have is a great deal of evidence in Jewish sources of the need to support refugees. However, how many refugees exactly there were is difficult to say. We do not know if the reports are exact or not, but the one thing which is important to us is if there are reports of refugees, that means the people were behaving logically. The Jews were doing the most intelligent thing to do. So that there, we have reports of Jews who fled. We also have reports of Jews who converted, some of whom who joined the fighting forces themselves. This, of course, is very, very interesting. Why? It means that, if, that within Ukrainian society, while there may have been hatred or dislike of Jews, there was an absence of racism. When you have racism, what happens when somebody converts? You do not accept. If you are a racist, the religion does not matter. A society which forces people to convert may not be a democratic, pluralistic society, but it is not a racist society, and it is important to keep this distinction. So some Jews converted and didn't die. Some Jews were refugees. Some Jews fled, were sold as slaves by the, by the Cossacks. No, that was selling slaves, but it was a Tatar business. This was a pretty confusing place and a confusing time. You didn't always know who you were fighting with. But the Tatars were big in taking slaves and selling them in Constantinople, and then they were often purchased by Jewish communities who freed them. So that we, it, the one thing that is clear is that nothing is clear. But this is the first stage in understanding. Now, what interests me in Bar is that not long ago, I was reading in a Ukrainian historical journal, learning how to read Ukrainian has its benefits, that in archaeological excavations in Bar, there was found a, a sack full of money, and by the coins, it was possible to date it to the period, period of Khmelnytschyn. This, to me, was very, very interesting because, according to the authors, very possibly, this money was left by Jews. A similar discovery was made in the city of Erfurt in Germany from 1340. And there, the analysis raised an interesting 
possibility. When do people hide money? A person hides money only for one reason. Why? They want to return and find the money. A person who believes that he will not return does not hide money. Either he takes it with him or he runs. But there is no point to hiding it if you do not think that you are going to come back. We cannot interview Jews from 1648. They're dead. We cannot interview anybody from 1648. But this behavior says something about the belief of the Jews as to what the situation would be. The person who hid the money, what did he think? He thought he would come back. If he thought that this is a national war of hatred, this would have, would he have thought of coming back? No, there would have been no reason to come back. So that this is an indication that this one individual who was rich, so apparently he was not stupid, but this one individual felt that the events of 1648 were not reflecting uh, the deep reality, but were a passing phenomenon. Can one build a generalization on one case? The answer is no. But if you have a theory, one case that fits is useful to cite. However, there are other sources that are more important. One is financial sources, and the other is more interesting because it is culture. The Jewish communities of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the ruling which ruled these areas at the time, paid taxes to the Polish government. Now, the Jewish community was autonomous. Was it autonomous because the Polish government was so concerned about Jewish life? No. The function of the Jewish communities was to collect taxes. And in order to collect taxes, they needed power and autonomy. And the Jewish community was organized by region. There was Poland was divided, the Commonwealth was divided into four lands, and they divided the taxes among them. There were important differences from year to year, which apparently had to do with internal politics that we don't know. But in 1655, the Jews of Rus, Volin, and Podilia were paying one quarter, 25% of all of the taxes paid by the Jews of Poland, Lithuania. Now, this is a very high percentage. It's lower than they paid before. <coughs> But it is not 5% or 6%. It is a serious amount of money. And this is a clear indication that already in 1655, many of the communities were not only reestablished, but were able to pay taxes to the central Jewish authority. Now, it is difficult to follow the taxes for later years because we have a shortage of sources, but we are rich in sources in another area entirely. And that is language. As may be known, in Yiddish, like other languages, 
has different dialects. And one can even put on a map the different dialects of Yiddish. And there is a distinctive Yiddish dialect which is common to the Ukrainian lands and reflects phonology of Ukrainian. Not exactly, but it reflects. Now, this is for me very interesting. There is no question that in the 19th century, there were many Jews in Ukraine. Hasidism, which is an important and big movement, began in the Ukraine. But we can ask a question. Who were the Jews who lived in Ukraine in the time of the 18th century, in the time of the Hasidism? There are two possibilities. One possibility is that after the events of 1648, the Jewish population was mainly eliminated. There were some refugees, some slaves, but basically the, the population of Jews did not exist. And then Jews from other areas of Poland saw an opportunity and quickly came to the Ukraine to do business. This is a possibility. It is not a very logical possibility because if the destruction was so massive, you would think they might be hesitant about coming to a dangerous place like the Ukraine. Of course, we all know how dangerous it is. It's so nice to walk around Kiev at night because it's not dangerous. But there are images. Now, this is one possibility. The other possibility is that the people who ran away and knew that the Ukraine was a good place to live, after there was quiet, came back. This is possibility number two. Which possibility is more likely? If the Jews who lived in Ukraine in the time of Hasidism had come from Lublin, had come from Krakow, came from Brest, from Pins, from Vilnius, what would have been their Yiddish? It would have been the Yiddish of the northern region. It could have been that very quickly the Yiddish changed. And there was a big meeting and everybody said, we will change our Yiddish. But that is not how languages change. And it is a little difficult to think that in such a short time, a new tradition of Yiddish was created. But it's not just Yiddish. It's folklore. It's traditions of food. It's traditions of ceremonies. The Jewish population of Ukraine is a very distinct population. One of my dreams is to take the divisions of Jewish folklore and to find someone who knows the divisions of Ukrainian folklore and to see if the borders are the same. It would be very interesting. But in any case, there is a distinctive Ukrainian Jewish tradition. If most of the population returned, this makes sense. If most of the population were new to the Ukraine, then it is really quite curious how they so quickly created a uh, new, one could say, national tradition. So now it is necessary to return once again to speculation. We know that in 1765, there were about 140,000 Jews in Ukraine. 
more or less, 10,000 more, 20,000 more or less. How do we know? Because there was a census of the Jews that was made in 1765 because the Polish government wanted to get more taxes. The Jews were surprised the census was good. The next census, the Jews already figured out what a census is about, and they knew how to play with the numbers. But the first census was good. Now, if we take 140,000, and we assume a population growth of a little more than 1% a, a year, which fits what we know about the population, this would mean that the starting population in 1650 would have been about 46,000. This is a very nice number, because if we take the population, even including red moose, we assume that there were about 15,000 casualties, either by sword or by disease, plus captives who did not return, plus converts who remained Christians, plus thousands of refugees who returned, it is easy to see how we could get to a number of about 50,000 who were the basis for the Ukrainian Jewish community of later periods. The numbers make sense, but they make sense only if we assume that the majority of the Jewish population survived this period of violence and great difficulty. And they survived only if there was a great deal of hatred, but no attempt to systematically eliminate the Jewish community, a period in which many people died because there were also many hatreds on every side. So that in this respect, the numbers and the implication of the numbers change entirely. With numbers like 100,000, which I think are absolutely imaginary, then you lead to all kinds of conclusions. If one simply takes away one zero, the difference between 100,000 and 10,000 is zero at the end. Take away one zero, then everything begins to make one sense, more sense. Each life is a world. And there is no competition, I think, in greater tragedy or less tragedy. A tragedy is a tragedy. A child is a child from any nation. And I think that in looking at the past, first off, it is useful to forget. You can't, it's not good to remember too much. And secondly, it is important to look at realities and to beware of images, because images are sometimes useful, but very often do not reveal what was the reality. Now, so when I stand and talk, I seem very certain, and I have numbers, and I have places. The truth is, much more has to be done to get a more exact picture. And what I would hope very much is to have a context within also cooperative efforts with other populations of the regions in order to get a more coherent picture of what happened in the entire region among all the groups that were present. And in this respect, I can only ask if anybody has ideas and suggestions, I will write my email address. And we have time for questions and answers. Although I must tell you that for many of the questions, or I don't know how many questions there will be, I will have to say often those terrible words, I do not know, because so much I don't know. But hopefully it will be possible to learn more. This is my email address.
I would be very grateful if whoever you think might have information or ideas uh, to please tell them. I can only learn and gain by this. So, uh, I'm sorry I finished one minute late. If there are questions, or comments, or suggestions, I am ready to write things down. H U H H U. This is actually University. Hebrew University, wow. Jerusalem, yes. Israel. It's H U J I. A C and an I L is Israel. So, please feel free to. Uh, and comments because I, I wrote an article which appeared 12, 10 years ago. AC point. AC point I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote an article on this topic which I just discovered was published in Depopretrovsk last year in Russian, which is very nice, but I was never told, so it was a very interesting surprise, I guess. That's the way you do business in Denver Petrovsk. But it was translated into Russian. Yeah. Uh, but I just discovered this uh, I'm sorry, what Al Allah? Uh, Man Manya brought it to me and I was very happy to see that it exists. So uh, I wrote an article, but I want to return to the topic and to make a small monograph. I, I was working on the data and I, because I've been looking for more and more information. And there is a book in Hebrew called Tit Hayaven, or Tit Hayavan, which has what is supposed to be lists of all the Jews, the number of Jews that were killed. In this place, so many, in another place, so many, and a very detailed list, but I thought the numbers were quite imaginary. Because as I told you, it, just, it doesn't make sense. And then late one night, I decided I would try to identify the towns on the list. A number of people have tried, and it's easy to identify some of the towns, but I want to identify all of them. So I took the very famous map of, it starts with a B, what's his name? The Frenchman. The Beauplan. I took his map, and I took the list of uh, Titayavan, and I decided to look for the cities. And I was based on a simple idea that I had. If I would ask you to write down all the cities and towns of Ukraine that you know, how would you do that? My guess is, you would write down a few of the big cities, but you know many small cities, then you would probably go region by region. Because to think of many small towns, you don't go like this. You go like this. So I wanted to try and identify the places. And I found one town, and I marked it on my new map of Ukraine. And then I found another town, and I looked in both plant, and then the first town disappeared for me. And I began to feel, Shaul, you are beginning to have visions. You know, <laughs> and this is the wrong thing to have visions about. And it took me a little while to figure out that with both plant, at the top, it is the south. Yes. And at the bottom, yes. Yes. for sure. <laughs> People, you know things. I don't know anything. So once I realized that the east and west were switched, everything was much easier. And I discovered that what I thought 
the tit hayaven really goes region by region. And then I began to ask, so how did he know so much Ukrainian geography? Because even if you live in one part of Ukraine, you're not going to know all the small places elsewhere. My conclusion, which is tentative, so please do not publish it in the newspaper yet, is that this is basically a tax list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he got a tax list, and he thought that the numbers were population, and really, it's money. So that you can use this to measure relative size of communities, because big communities paid bigger taxes. But you cannot use the amount of money as an absolute number of the population. So there's a lot of room for research, and it should be interesting for Ukrainian studies, because it is a very nice list of small communities from an early period where we would like to have more material. So in any case, there is a lot more that has to be done, but I need advice and criticism and comments, I will be very happy to send the article in English if you write to my email. And when I get home, I will scan the Russian. But since I never saw it, I have no idea if it is a good translation or not. I hope it's good. But uh, I, can, I will be happy to send that. I perhaps should ask for permission, but there is a Hebrew phrase, if you steal from a robber, it's all right. So if they print it without asking, then I can copy also. So you're welcome to write. But I do want some questions. Yes. Um, it might be not a question to you. What were the ecological evidences about uh, this topic? Some, I don't know, mass graves or the belongings of Ukrainian Jews somewhere in the West found uh, ecological uh, material. I, I, have, I would be very interested in graves. Extremely interested. Actually, I have a new project, which I'm not even, I didn't even talk to you about. Uh, in Poland, they did some excavations of Jewish graves, and they measured the size of the bones. And this is very interesting, because height is a reflection of nutrition. And I think it should be possible to use the size of the bones to get evidence for nutrition in the past. However, I have not read of any excavation of sites in Ukraine of mass burials from this period. And it would be also very difficult to learn simply from a mass grave. Because under the skin, we are all alike. And if you have a mass grave, it could be Jews. It could be Ukrainians, it could be Poles, because everybody was busy killing everybody else. And unless you have some kind of evidence in the grave of the identity, which is not easy, because most evidence is organic, and that very quickly disappears, when you look at bones, you don't know whose they are. But if you find something that would be evidence, I would be very eager to read about it. I, I, I thought about it. What I think would be possible is also maps of cities where you can measure population density and see what is reasonable, how many houses there were, and then you could see if the numbers that we have from tax lists are similar to the realities. But this is also very difficult for an early period. But perhaps.
Uh, well, uh, I gave a class to my students here, and I discussed the fact that a school is very similar to a prison. And children go to school to keep them off the streets. That might be true for schools. It is not true for a lecture. So, if there are no questions, and since this is not a prison, then I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.